The Scary Stories book is my childhood, a very important part of my childhood. They still have power now to adults, I think, but to a kid they're just this perfect blend of frightening and mysterious and a little bit beautiful, I think. Part of Alvin Schwartz's brilliance was that he took all these old folk legends and made them readable for kids. And I think that's his particular genius. My dad was not well-known or, or prominent. He labored in the shadows most of his life. Hey everyone, this is Matt Stewart from the Simplistic Reviews Podcast, and this is another Simplistic Interview. Um, this time, I have a pretty awesome guest lined up for this podcast and this interview. Um, as many people have probably listened to interviews before, we've had some other cool directors on, a very diverse group. Um, this is kind of special for me, especially, because this is um, part of my childhood kind of here right now, so... Really cool guest to have on here. We have a Cody a Mer It's Merrick, correct? Cody Merrick. Let me make sure I got that. Right. Merrick, yep. Mm -hmm. Cody Merrick, yep. yeah. Cody Merrick, uh, the director of the new documentary that was just released on VOD and soon to be on uh, DVD coming in July about the infamous or famous or whatever you want to call it, the scary stories to tell in the dark. And his documentary is appropriately titled "Scary Stories." So thank you so much for uh, uh, you know jumping on the show, Cody. I really do appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, let's just kind of dive right into it. Um, why a documentary about scary stories? What what what's the genesis of this, and what's the genesis of the scary stories to tell in the dark books for you as a child growing up and now as an adult doing a documentary about it? Sure. So rewind about five years. Okay, five <laughs> and, years. <laughs> and I, I kind of. I had the mind in mind to, you know, to take part in my first, you know, full length documentary. I kind of had the skills and I, I, I generally kind of had the, the, the know how enough to assemble a, a, a documentary and it seemed like kind of the next step in a number of different ways. And, and my background is a bit in children's literature to some degree as far as uh, media uh, and that sort of thing and so um, and also it's just an interest of mine right I, I, I'm surprised more people haven't done documentaries about how important it is to get kids reading of a certain age um, you know you, you grow up and you know and you, you, it becomes a nostalgia title but what is what is nostalgia it's foundational right it's, mm -hmm. it's the beginnings of what we became ended up becoming right so um, so there was a, a general interest in a documentary having to do with literacy and kind of the importance of getting kids reading and le children's literature and that sort of thing so um, you want you know, an entry point. You want something that's pretty engaging, gets people interested um, to, to delve into it and it may have the end goal, which is, you know, this idea that it's important to get kids reading, but, um, but you want a topic that's, you know, meaty and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And what I, I thought of these books. Yes, I grew up with these books. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, when the third book came out and they became the scary stories to tell in dark three books, came out between 1981 and 1991. In 1991, when they really started to pick up steam as far as, you know, popularity with kids, I was 11 years old. So, uh, so <laughs> of course, I was reading those. I was reading a lot of R.L. Stein, who was also in, yeah. the, in the documentary and a number of other things. And of course, by middle school, you know, I was reading Stephen King and that sort of thing. But, you know, it all started in, you know, mid to late elementary school that, you know, got me reading and really interested in reading and, and I went on to get degrees in English literature and so on. So, um, so I thought of these books and then I just kind of to basically kind of saw, uh, I didn't, didn't know the entire story, but I saw a lot of uh, pieces of the story, you know, and certainly censorship was a big part of that because I just saw, okay, it's not just kind of, 
you know, building up these books and talking about these books and, and getting to know the inside story and that sort of thing. It's actually pivoting and saying, okay, but they're also, this is arguably the most banned or challenged children's book of the last 40 years. It was number one in the 1990s, the first time they put together a 10-year list and that sort of thing. So there was a big censorship piece that I knew it was going to kind of, you know, become a big part of it. Um, so it, it was all those pieces together. It also, it's all based in folklore and urban legends. So, you know, the folklore aspect was really interesting to me. And um, of course, the everyone remembers the illustrations. <laughs> and that was a, that, that's certainly a big part of it as well. So there was, when you when you have in mind starting a documentary, the number one thing is you want a lot of doors to open. You know, <laughs> you, yeah. know you want a lot to explore. And I saw this and I was like, you know what? I got so much going here. It, I can't imagine, you know, I'm going to ha have any problem opening doors and talking to different people and getting the inside story and that sort of thing. So, so that's really what it started. I saw a story and, um, and so I just kind of got started from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I grew up on the, I, I remember very vividly, like right around the same time, el elementary school is kind of when I started picking up these books, it was, you know, either Fear Street stuff. So it was Christopher Pike. It was the mm -hmm. stories to tell in the dark. It was R.L. Stein. It was Bruce Cor mm -hmm. uh, Co Coville, who you also have a small yeah. little excerpt in the, in the film with a book about aliens, mm -hmm. a book about monsters and all the scholastic. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, as a kid too, I was always, didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't be in the Scholastic Book Club all the time. I couldn't afford it like every every other kid. So I had to piecemeal mm -hmm. a lot of these books together. I think I the first time I couldn't afford all three books in the three book set. Um, so I had to ask the kind person at Walden Books to say, "Look, I can't really afford everything. Would you be really cool?" to maybe just give me scary stories to tell in dark the first book. And can I keep the cool little book or the little book case that, that it came with? And then I promise in the next couple, coming weeks, I'll save my allowance and I'll buy the other three, the other two books as well too. But <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, vivid, awesome. it, it's vivid memories. It's telling these, like trying to be like a really creepy kid and tell people the stories. And, and it, I don't know when I'm like six, when I'm like seven or eight years old or something like that, I'm trying to pass these off as my own. It's like, Oh, I know this story. I made it up. So, um, but it was always so vivid for me and it's such a great memory, but bringing up the whole. And, and the, the I was just going to say, I mean, the nice thing about having, you know, kind of returning to these after a few decades is that mm -hmm. you realize that so many other people had a very similar experience. And that's what yes. I've kind of heard over and over again, which is really neat, is that, you know, you, it's uh, you, so many people had no idea that everyone else was having the same experience. It becomes a communal thing. I mean, the internet certainly helps too, where yeah. you, you, you return to it 20 years, 20 years, 30 years later, whatever it is, and you realize there was a there was a thing. There was there was something that was happening amongst a lot of people mm -hmm. that a lot of people had a similar experience with a particular title, and it it, it becomes communal, and that's kind of what story, scary stories or any stories become after some time, is that it becomes a communal experience where a lot of people had an experience with these stories or with these illustrations and that sort of thing, and and, and that's a really good starting off point to you know jump into a documentary yeah and then it, you, you you incorporate the whole like kind of i don't want to say subculture but I, I will for lack of a better term these people that have taken the love for it when they were our age and then they're making art about it they're doing their own illustrations or creating art galleries around it and it's traveling around the country which is amazing but mm -hmm. seeing like people and even other other authors that you're that you're interviewing as well too. I mean, this was so important to so many people. And when you think about it too, that the fact that this was almost taken away by some moody adults or some like you know school like you know people who wanted to be in the PTA and things like that, taking books away and taking away things that are important to people because. Of, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of this now in this day and age, not just books, but about a lot of other things that people think, you know, I know best. Uh, you don't get to have this because this is not something I would do. So um, how, how was that? I mean, I'll kind of segue into that, like in interviewing somebody like, you know, uh, like Sandy Van Vanderberg, who was like kind of like the spearhead of the, of the PTA plan to like stop these books from being in libraries and saying, you know, we can have kids reading books, but they can't read these books type of thing. How was that Genesis like meeting her, interviewing her, 
seeing how she felt from the time she was uh, kind of uh, spearheading the kind of stop, ban the books to like now, you know, how, how did that kind of come together? And how, did, how was that interaction with you and her during the, the course of the documentary? It was, it was interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, she was, she's a lovely person. Now, I, you know, that's the thing with, you know, I, I'd like to think I presented a certain amount of uh, a nuance to this issue because I think there is some nuance and I think it's a tricky thing. Like, now that said, uh, it, I think it varies. Like, I, I, I think absolutely there are some parents who, you know, um, if you were to get a, you talk candidly with them, <clears throat> they wouldn't just say they want these books removed from elementary schools. They would say these books are from the devil. That <laughs> Satan <course>. personally, you <laughs> know, provided these books yeah. to us so that we could be drawn to, blood, yeah. you know, Satan or whatever. Whatever. I don't know. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but yeah. whatever hyperbole they want to make it. people out there. Yeah, I mean, there's probably, there are certain, no, I, I say probably there are certain people that kind of go to a certain extreme. Mm -hmm. That said, Sandy and a number of other parents are, uh, are more of, you know, okay, I don't, I, I, you know, yes, you can call me a banner. Me, I'm calling the age appropriateness. I don't think it's appropriate for elementary schools, which is, um, a tricky thing because, you know, when you're saying that, you're saying it's not a, it shouldn't be available to any ele elementary school kids, you know, and that's, you know, we, <laughs> I mean, the joke is we live in a society, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say, we all have to live together. If you're going to a public school, we all have to collectively decide to send our kids there and yeah. we have to have, make these decisions on what should, should or shouldn't be in the available to the library and how to to some degree monitor that and and i'm a big proponent for uh, librarians because they're the ones in the middle of this and and they're often subject to the whims of parents and administrators and superintendents and so on and so forth and and the push and pull and all, all ptas and so on and so forth mm -hmm. they're in the middle of it they're just kind of their interest is getting kids reading and and i and um i tend to a sympathize with that and B kind of think of them as the ones that are on the front lines in the middle of these debates. Um, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, what the American Library Association generally says and what I tend to say is, you know, first and foremost, it's important that we have this discussion because a vast majority of the time it's actually done real quietly. Now, you know, Sandy and, and what happened back in Seattle years ago, that was an entry point for me because I could, I had, foot, you know, archival footage. I had a particular case. I, we could, you know, delve into it. It was the most pro, high profile case of these books being censored. You know, it was literally on the Today Show and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it was a good entry point to discuss it. But at the same time, like I said, uh, you know, uh, it, it makes for something that, you know, can be, you know, uh, wrapped into a documentary, which was which is great, and I think is really interesting. At the same time, you know, there's also a, a million other cases that aren't discussed. It's just kind of quietly happened, and that's what the, generally the American Library Association often says is that it's just kind of you know books are take, taken off shelves because there's some one person, one parent, whatever it is, just asked them, and it, it quietly just happens. So the idea here with these you know, particular books is to kind of raise awareness and raise questions. Okay, we removed a book. Here's a particular case, most challenged book of the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And um, it had a positive effect for a lot of people. So it starts to, you know, question, you, you start to question a lot of things when, when, when you see that a book had a lot of positive effect, as well as it being so heavily challenged. So it makes for a really interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, because I mean, reading. I mean, and, and from the interview, this this is for some people the only book that their kids read, or this was the book that helped their kids learn to read or not be a, not be scared of reading or something like that. And that has that being said is extremely important because we live in such a digital age now where people are still reading books or reading books people are still writing books but we're becoming more fixated on you know on your phone on your ipad on this and that and how much reading is really 
you know, it, it's almost like if, if you don't pay attention, you're going to slowly, like, like you were saying, lose your freedom to read or lose your freedom to read the books that you want. Or by the, by the time you know it, they're just going to be completely gone. And I think it points out a very important lesson that um, pointing things out like this, like this is from the past. Yeah, this happened like, you know, nearly 30 years ago at this point, but mm -hmm. it could happen again. I mean, it's like it kind of went away. It does, still you know. does happen. I mean, that's the thing. You know, yes, if someone wants to turn around and make a documentary about um, Captain Underpants, that's yeah. still heavily censored. Mm -hmm. someone, I'm sitting at literally looking at a Captain Underpants book <laughs> because it's my son's favorite. You know, I mean, there's, there's a, a, you know, it tends to change with the time. So no doubt, like, you know, it, this is a, a great time to do this documentary about scary stories to tell in the dark because it some time has passed and we kind of can look at it. But like I said, if someone wants to do a documentary about another book series and mm -hmm. talk about censorship in that case, they absolutely could because it still happens. It, it, it's, it tends to change with the times. Yep. Um, nowadays, uh, it's, uh, well, what we get into a little bit is kind of the eighties and nineties and what they call the satanic panic where yes. everyone's <laughs> talking about cults and uh, Satanists and stuff in the news. So yep. it just kind of translated to, okay, now it's anything having to do with, you know, evil, you know, yep. <laughs> at all, you know, death and dying, so on and so forth. That's, that, that's some kind of route to what, what I just happened to see on the news tonight, whatever, you know, and um, that's not as much prominent now. And so, you know, now it's other books that, you know, have to do with other more, you know, uh, you know topical things. Um, what it tends to be a lot of LGBT titles and it tends to be yes. um, uh, 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 cultural books that, mm -hmm. you know, discuss, things that are, are tricky, you know, yeah. and admittedly, you know, there's a certain amount of age appropriateness there. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at some point, you know, kids need to, to, to address these things where at, at the very least, you know, uh, you know, parents have a good argument why, you know, their kids are, should be perfectly fine in reading them and that sort of thing. So it gets into a lot of tricky things for sure. And, um, yeah, so it's yeah. it's a tricky thing, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. Well, the lesson here is that if you read scary stories to to scary stories to tell in the dark, or more scary stories to tell in the dark, you're not going you're not going to run out and join the satanic church and sacrifice virgins or young babies or anything like that. I, I want to make that I perfectly mean, clear for everybody <laughs> out here. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean that, <laughs> that that's the joke I've kind of made. Is you know, I talk I talk to a lot of people who grew up in these books, and I didn't find a homicidal maniac once. It was really yeah. weird. <laughs> it's, it's like who the fuck? It's like everybody. They they were so worried about all these kids growing up to be people like you and I. Now you're making documentaries. I'm doing podcasts. So mm -hmm. go go go. He goes to figure that we're going to be just fine. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, how how was your time spending with uh, Peter uh, Peter Schwar uh, Schwartz? and everything like that like getting to know him and learning more about his family upbringing and learning more about his relationship with you know his father Alvin and stuff like that and then how was that final segment with you guys when you actually put Peter and Sandy in the same room and I love how you kind of had that at the end where they're having a amicable conversation they can debate I mean because I think the big thing that we have a problem with these days is debating Nobody wants yep. to debate. Everybody wants to argue. Everybody has a very, very strong opinion. And if you don't agree with them, they will either walk away, tell you to go to hell, or tell you to go yeah. die. I mean, whatever form of internet trolling they want to be involved with. But it was interesting. I, I love at the end how you incorporated that because I'm always a big proponent of I'll debate very – like let's debate logically. Let's have a discourse. I mean, I, would, I hope we have a discourse because that's, that's how you – get ideas passed passed around so but just overall how was your time with with you know peter and just kind of learning more about his relationship with alvin his father and when he was writing these books um it was great i mean so it it kind of spans years so it, it's the type of thing that like it didn't uh you know and that's there's, there's a benefit. Would it have been great to have accomplished this documentary in a much shorter amount of time? Yes, but at the same time, there's a benefit to things happening over the course of several years. So, you know, it was just a number of emails and him kind of following, you know, doing, seeing a couple early trailers and things like that. Um, so he was able to kind of track 
kind of what I was doing and what I was getting at, and which was really helpful because, you know, by the time I go and travel, he's in Seattle and that's kind of where we met and, 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 uh, and filmed. Um, and and with the, with the location of this particular case of of, of the books being challenged um, by by Ben, he kind of knew what I was getting at, and yeah. he, he you know and and which was really helpful because he just totally dug it. He totally uh, you know, and to this day, you know, digs like what we were doing, which is to say, you know, I you know Alvin Schwartz, you know. Uh, was you know has been quoted as saying he thought he was humorous i mean as far as these books being challenged he got a kick out of it right of course yeah and 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 um you know uh fast forward to now it's like you know it's it's there's a nice part of the legacy of these books uh, can be not just that kids it got kids reading not that we got a good scare of it yes we did absolutely and and that's all part of the legacy but you can kind of uh, attach you know some other uh, additional meaning to it and that's um that's what i think they kind of appreciate and 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 i think peter schwartz had a you know um complicated relationship with his father and i i, I get i got I knew about that beforehand to some degree. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, it's nothing like just kind of interviewing him for hours and talk, talking and really getting out of it. Then you kind of learn more of the, the, what the, how that story came to play. And um, that said, you know, for, from the standpoint of the story, I appreciated that he was the one who was defending his, his father's books. Yeah, and he was the one kind of standing in for him when when his father passed away, you know, decades ago, and and couldn't do that, and so I thought it was just, um, he, and and at the same time he's just an incredibly intelligent, very you know reasoned person, so it just it wasn't that surprising that it went the way it did, and I liked it because you know you juxtapose it to you know like you were saying you know it was a very calm conversation you know these were two you know you know reasonable people who were definitely on different sides of the issue in various ways although not to the extreme right it didn't end up with blows because and i knew when because i didn't feel like they were either of them were that extreme in their in their thinking um but you juxtapose that next to a lot of other footage I, I gave as far as what a board meeting usually looks like, oh, which yeah. is people standing up and and just vehemently, you know, opposed to, you know, the books being in the school or vice versa, be, uh, very opposed to other parents who think they should be removed. And it just becomes very heated and it's not very conducive to <laughs> a, uh, a discussion of, you know, that again, I think has some nuance and is a tricky thing. And, and like I said, we, we all have to go to the same school. So we all have to live with each other and we have to live with, you know, other parents and, it's, you know, but it is not very conducive when, when you in the school board meeting, people just stand up and are just very, yeah. <laughs> very passionate. Right. <laughs> and so, so it was, it was purposely kind of meant to be like, okay, this is what ideally what happens. And I'm not saying we're solving anything with this. It's, mm-hmm. it's more about furthering the discussion, but I, th- I thought it was a good example of what can happen even with people who are very much on different sides of the, the discussion. Yeah, the school board meetings were kind of like pre-Twitter because that's what I think of Twitter and everything else as. Every <laughs> every Reddit board, every 4chan board, every, every board that you can go to where it's just like, this is this is my opinion. I'm loud and this is what's going to happen. It's like, well, I'm glad you made your voice heard because I can hear you. So, you know, you did a great job. It's just funny that the more things – change the more they stay the same it's still the same thing we just do it behind the veil of the internet where you don't know our real name you don't know what we look like you don't know how old we are and you don't know what gender we are or anything like that too so uh, it was mm-hmm. back in the day at least you could look somebody in the eye and hey if it came to blows it came to blows but now you know you don't know what anybody's saying and people just really want an opinion and uh, mm-hmm. whatever that's that's where we live in right now so <laughs> well Another thing I want to bring up uh, is kind of the um, 
when you guys are, when you're telling the story, like during the librarian story and uh, that whole kind of story that goes throughout the entire uh, uh, documentary with librarian being told by the principal, like you have to remove these books because it was yelled, uh, uh, mom yelled at him, and he's like, she's like, no, I'm not going to take it out. And then eventually, she meets the parent on Halloween with her kids dressed up like skeletons and a witch and everything, and said, yeah, you should probably withdraw that because you are. Uh, the exact opposite <laughs> like everything you're saying makes absolutely no sense so <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I guess bring that up because I love the illustrations because obviously it's very you know Stephen Gamble-esque um, I know you weren't really able you know I know Stephen Gamble just as a principal is a very like private guy he does not do interviews he doesn't do anything and uh, getting that one little snippet of him doing an interview was amazing because I don't think anybody, most people don't know what the guy looks like or what he sounds like or his opinion about anything. Mm -hmm. But this is his lasting mm -hmm. legacy, these illustrations that are so burned in people's minds. Now, with the art during the story, was it just somebody who was inspired by Gamble and did the illustrations or did Gamble reach out to, to tell you anything about, Hey, I'll give you an idea for the illustration. Like how did that come to be the, the illustration parts of the documentary? So I, I, I felt like it was, uh, you know, in going, going and doing a documentary, one question is always how, you know, film is a visual medium. So finding opportunities. Yes, you're going to have a certain amount of talking heads, but you also want to find ways to mix things up to make it a little more interesting to tell different stories within the larger story. And that story of the librarian who, you know, was confronted with a situation was very indicative of, you know, what this is all about, right? It was and almost so, a scary um, story so, in and of itself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, uh, so not just telling that story, but illustrating that story was a perfect uh, opportunity to, you know, to do what I felt like a lot of people, including myself, wanted to see, which is see these illustrations brought to life a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't exactly have the, I didn't have the Pixar money, so it was going <laughs> to be done on a certain level, no doubt about it. But at the same time, I felt like if I, you know, uh, concentrate on telling the particulars. I couldn't adapt the stories, uh, which had no intention to, but, you know, telling a, a different story that was kind of the heart of this um, and doing it in the Stephen Gamble style is something that, A, I want to see, and I assume every a lot of other people want to see. So um, Shane Hunt is his name. He's in, uh, he, I knew he could do, I, I knew he could do uh, the Stephen Gamble like style um, and and he and he could animate. He had never done the two together, mm -hmm. so that was an experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, but so it was. But it was a good starting off point to say, okay, you know, it's not. It's it's going to be real tricky going to an animator out of nowhere and say, you know, you know, uh, do a Stephen Gamble like illustration. And not everyone has the animation experience, although a lot of people can do somewhat Stephen Gamble like stuff and so his was just a really good melding of the you know having enough experience with both and um and i think it turned out great um but yeah i mean the, as far as Stephen gamble is concerned yes you're right i mean there's um he kind of has i knew going into it that he doesn't do interviews and has long has a ha, has had a long history of not doing interviews and so it was always a little bit of a long shot mm -hmm. um um, I, I felt lucky enough to at least be able to find an interview he did do a long time ago, which, which, you know, he talked about his childhood. He talked about, you know, what his influence are, influences were and things like that. And so, you know, uh, I, I don't think anyone's going to get that interview. I'm willing to put money on it. But <laughs> so uh, if I can at least do that, I felt is, is you know, the, uh, the most, you know, the best I could do, you know? Yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, and he's, 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 he's he almost has, a, he's up to a mythic status at this point because as good as, as well done as the stories are and as well done as Alvin Schwartz did with the books, the lasting effect are the illustrations. I mean, it's, it, they're, they're iconic. They're burned in people's heads. I mean, anything between the girl with no eyes or just the creepy, I mean, anything with Harold. And I'm, I'm glad Harold was kind of like a big highlight of the uh, of the documentary as well, too, because I feel like it's one of the most iconic stories in the entire series as well. Um, and, well, uh, Harold, just, just so, I mean, one thing I point out, though, is, I mean, 
<sighs> okay. There would be no Herald if there wasn't for Alvin Schwartz, which yes. is to say I went to the source material. It was just one story in some dusty book of folklore <laughs> that no one had ever heard of. I'm uh, Virtually no one. It sure, certainly had been pretty much forgotten. It was, again, it was just one of many stories and Alvin Schwartz plucked it out of obscurity and, and made it in, and it, he changed it quite. I mean, he made it what it is now because it's quite a bit different than what he read. It, you know, uh, he definitely adapted it, but he, he translated it um, into the, the story that everyone knows. And now Harold is a boogeyman. He's, he's he like, is. For so many people, he's the Freddy Krueger, you know, that sort of thing. And, and um, so, yeah, you know, there's a, there, are no, there are other stories that um, would still have a life because, you know, okay, the guy with the hook. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that existed before. And, you know, even though it's, a, it's definitely part of the scary stories to tell in dark books, Mm-hmm. Um, it it isn't tied to that book series as much as um, a number of others. A number of others, like like you said, you know, Alvin Schwartz kind of, you know, became his own, you know, a little bit of a modern day uh, Grimm's brother mm-hmm. by, you know, uh, taking it and adapting it and turning it into something that really took off. And so I give a, you know, you, you got, you'd, I give a lot of credit to both and that's really kind of what I try to do with the documentary is give a lot of um a lot of time and, and homage to 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 both and I don't you know uh, I don't think the book would be the same if it didn't have both of them because you know both of them existed outside of each other mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. Alvin Schwartz read many other books Stephen mm-hmm. Gamble illustrated many other books just out of total randomness, these two together kind of created a three books that kind of transcended, you know, a lot of what they're going to be known for, you know? And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's neat. <laughs> it's yeah. unique. And, uh, and, and also, but to go back to your point, yes. I mean, you know, they changed the illustrations and I just don't think they had any idea because keep in mind children's, books they change illustrators all the time and just yeah. don't think anything of it <laughs> this is the difference <laughs> these these illustrations matter and uh and so um you know uh that's that's a unique and weird situation where you have a book series where the illustrator has become just as beloved as the author i mean that's that's uh, a, a very interesting case yeah, and it, it was funny when the the illustrations were modified and they were cleaned up, or you know, kind of like I don't want to say dumbed down because the illustrations are still great, the new ones, but they don't have the same effect. And it was funny having everybody come out and say, "You've ruined my childhood." This is it's like, <laughs> it's like the, you know the Transformers argument or any other remake that people it, it's so beloved that you take something, you modify it, and it's automatically like big fervor. And then of course you see on the um, on eBay and all. all internet and everything people selling the old illustrations like the old dusty books that they probably had since like fifth grade or something and they're selling online for the knee-jerk reaction of it of course is always hilarious to me um Mm -hmm. but i mean it's it's just always it's so it's just funny how nostalgia uh and just remembering something from your childhood that's so raw and it it helped you probably through a lot of, you know, I'm sure for for a lot of people, I'm sure these books helped a lot of people too, you know, Uh, not only helping them read, but, you know, just telling stories and getting people to like, well, if they can make a story, why can't I make, no, it's just influence and on influence. And it's passing the idea of folklore along and because you don't really have that anymore. Cause I remember as a kid, the big folklore in my neighborhood or town was that there was always a guy named farmer Joe who lived out in the woods and if you went out into the woods, and this was over by my old, like old elementary school, if you went out into the woods, you could go to a shack. But if he caught you, he would like, cut your head off or something like that too. So passing the oral tradition along over and over and over again is so important. And we don't really have it because everything's in a database now too. Like nothing's really in a book that you could pass on. Or oral tradition is kind of like you know, dying. You know, I'm sure it still happens in other other countries, but in America it's not really a big thing anymore for us. So it's yeah. great to kind of remind people like, Hey, by the way, this was the old folklore and oral, tra- oral traditions that you remembered as a kid. So hopefully it inspires people to maybe 
keep pick it back up and maybe pass those stories on to their kids. I mean, and and and, and, <laughs> and it and and it matters. I mean, that's you know that's uh, one of my takeaways and what I kind of geeked out with is that you know uh, folklore of uh, of different places and locations it it matters and it actually demonstrates all kinds of things about the people that choose to tell those stories, right? Mm-hmm. The ones that kind of, you know, uh, become, you know, larger than life and that sort of thing, you know, you can get under it and you can learn a little bit about ourselves by looking closer at why did this store, story, you know, become really popular in this area and that area and so on and so forth. And that's, and that's just kind of the English literature nerd with me is that, you know, I find that interesting and fun to kind of, you know, look at, you know, a, a story or a series of stories and kind of what does that tell us about us, you know, or these people in this geographical region, so on and so forth. That's, you know, that's interesting and, and worth studying. Absolutely. Yes. Now, um, just in terms of the story, so we'll kind of wrap everything up in a tight little bow right here. Um, out of all three books, what is the story that you've taken as kind of the story you love the most or, you know, just what, what do you take away from these books as an adult now, you know, being a child reading them and then going back and reading them again as an, as an adult, what story or stories for that matter have, maybe had the most profound effect on you? It's changed a little bit. Yeah. And I, I uh, over time, I'm going to, uh, it shifted and the more I thought about it. And the one that's kind of stood out to me, and uh, ironically, it's barely, it's, it's actually not really in the documentary, which mm-hmm. is weird to say that, but there's, there's over 80 stories and it's hard. Yeah. And, and sometimes it was just a matter of what other people talked about rather than, you know, and, and also just kind of where the story led, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, but this, the story I tend to go back to is actually the very first story mm-hmm. in the very first book, which is The Big Toe. Yep. <laughs> and um, so what's, what's unique about that is, you know, Mark, uh, kind of famously, um, it's tied to uh, uh, another version of it called the golden um the golden arm which Mm -hmm. um uh is and now it's become kind of a trope where okay there's a bunch of different variations they're all kind of the golden arm story or the big toe story so on and so forth um and mark twain actually would had a speech and wrote you know a paper about how he demonstrated how the golden arm again also the big toe story Mm -hmm. is kind of a really good example of how to tell a story or how important it is to tell a story, mm-hmm. which I found really interesting because really, you know, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't it often doesn't matter what happens in the story. It's how you tell the story that, mm-hmm. you know, and so in the case of, you know, the big toe, um, it's not just a matter. I could just tell you what happens. A kid finds a toe. He, he actually, him and his parents eat it. And the, <laughs> the person who ha- had the toe gets out, comes out of the ground and comes and gets him. Right. Yeah. What I just said there was the most boring story you've ever heard in your life, or it certainly wasn't very, you know, it didn't capture your imagination. Mm-hmm. Spread that particular story out to about five to eight minutes and mm-hmm. really, and start getting details. Oh, this happened to, you know, uh, cousin, you know, Bill that lives, you know, in the next town and, and, and start incorporate all kinds of, you turn that, you can turn that into one of the scariest stories some kid will ever hear. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, build yeah. it up and build it up. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, uh, you know, again, it also is the first story in the first book. And it took, to me, as much as, you know, we get into all kinds of other stories, that's, kind of become the more one of the more iconic ones because it has so much history to it to it but it also kind of demonstrates like i said what mark twain said about you know how important it is how you tell a story exactly i mean it's and that's what's so great about these books i I remember when i was got a little bit older and i would have these books and sometimes i would have to babysit or something or be with my sister who's younger or whatever and i would tell these stories but of course telling the story the way you tell it is what makes it scary 
and making it real and making it relatable. It's like, oh, well, you know, our cousin, like you said, or our grandfather or somebody or like a, an ancestor who you might not know, but they live this far away and dragging it out and dragging it out and building the suspense. And it makes you a storyteller. Even though you're telling somebody else's story, you become the storyteller at that point, passing this, uh, you know, you're passing the oral tradition if you will. And I mean, that's, that's, that's a, I mean, I've always been more of a fan of like kind of the, the gore, like, and you talk about it in the documentaries uh, as well too, like uh, uh, the, the story about the sausage and everything like that. Yeah. Um, wonderful and, sausage. And, yeah. yeah. Wonderful mm-hmm. sausage. And I, I, I always loved that one. I think more scary stories. That was my favorite book out of the trilogy. Um, and that story always, I don't know. I, I loved it because it, it reminded me of like a story from like Tales from the Crypt, which there is actually another mm-hmm. story from Tales from the Crypt. Yes, yes, I remember that one. Yes, it had the the Superman in it, right? It had Superman in it, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and that was always, <laughs> and, and, and they ironically kill Meatloaf, and Meatloaf becomes the steak and everything like that too. So, I feel mm-hmm. like there were so yeah. many funny things going on in that story. But I mean, also just the um, the illustration on that with the hand eating it's i mean it's so much so mm-hmm. so much creepy the, the creep factor on that is intense and of course it's one of the you know stories of like oh the bad guy always gets his come up too so but it was always a, a fun story you know it was always one of my favorites and you know Bess is another story i liked a lot too with the horse and the guy can't get rid of the horse and it's his undoing at the very end and i mean all the, all the stories are are fantastic and uh, I guess with that being said, now, of course, the actual, you know, live action feature is going to be coming out, you know, similar to how Goosebumps, you know, they took their stories and wrapped it into a movie. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. Guillermo del Toro is producing this, so he does have his fingers in it. Um, but how do you see them mixing all this folklore, eight like 80 stories or so, into this feature film? And are you even looking forward to a feature film of scary oh yeah absolutely absolutely i like everyone involved i think you know it's a tricky thing and and that's the case with a totally different situation like doing a documentary but it's always a tricky thing uh, (laughs) you know trying to take something that a lot of people have a a very uh, strong attachment to and and doing something new and interesting but also you know still tied to what what was great about them it's it's a tricky balancing act but honestly from what i've seen it looks great i mean like i said i i really like everyone involved and um uh, i i i'm really interested and also uh del toro co-wrote it and what i tend to take away from that to some degree is del toro i think is particularly good at finding uh, uh, some heart to it mm-hmm. which is you know uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, develop characters in amongst, yes, you're going to get creeped out. And you're ultimately, you know, it's going to have a certain number of the stories that we love and, and that's going to be, it's going to be a roller coaster, but at the same time, you know, uh, from a story to a storytelling perspective, I also want to, okay, you know, let's, let's care about what happens to these kids and ultimately want them to, to survive and that yeah. sort of thing. And, and so I think, um, me personally, uh, uh, I I have a fair bit of confidence in it because, like I said, I, I think there's just really good storytellers there, um, you know, taking taking it on. But like I said, I don't uh, as much as you know, I enjoy doing this documentary and continue to talk about these stories. I don't. Um, uh, 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 I, I think it's a, a, a tricky situation they're in, so I, I can sympathize. Um, I've gotten a number of reviews. The reviews have been pretty good for this documentary, but at the same time, you know, I'm going to, some people are, are going to hate me because <laughs> of one thing or another. You ruined <laughs> so my you childhood. Kinda, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So so I, I, I could sympathize with them, but, but at the same time, I, I think, you know, from what I've seen and everyone involved, it looks great. Yeah. I, I mean, stylistically, it looks great. I mean, it looks like a lot of practical effects, which I'm always a fan of that, you know, not doing a lot of computerized things, but it will be interesting yeah. to see how they mesh everything and make it a one cohesive story with the iconic images that we're all used to from the book as well. So, I mean, looks yeah. great. looks fun. It looks creepy. Um, and I guess we'll have to see what happens in August when it finally comes out. So, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, and I guess a last question, um, what's next? I mean, I know it took you five years to make this documentary, so I'm no, I know you're probably not in a rush to 
dive right into the next topic. Uh, you, of course, you're still doing all the press for this, but um, in doing this film, did you get inspired to say like, okay, this is my passion project, but I love to do, what would you want to do kind of next? Or have you even thought about that yet? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, and that's just part of the process of, yes, this took five years, but it, the meat of it took about three years in the last year and a half. I've most been kind of, you know, uh, waiting for it to come out to some degree. There's yeah. always some work, but, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, I, you know, at some point when it, you say it takes a while to make it, yes, it does take a, a while, especially if you're doing it pretty, uh, you know, uh, on a, on a modest budget and that sort of thing. So I, the intention is to move on to a narrative film. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, that was always uh, you know, one of those things. I had a, a, a few ideas for documentary, but one particular story kind of took took the reins and overtook any ideas I had for another documentary. So, um, so that's generally the plan. Um, how much I can move that forward and how quickly we'll certainly have to see, like you said, took five years to do this. You always kind of want to do it, do the next film in a, sh hopefully a, a more, uh, you know, organized way and not quite take so long a time as well as, to do it in a way where, okay, maybe I can have a little bit more of a budget. That would be great. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, I'll, I'll be looking for it because I really enjoyed this documentary. It is a great reminder of just, you know, being nostalgic, but also learning a few new things about the kind of hard road that these books had to go through in order for one acceptance and two battling against people basically trying to deny people the right to read these books in a lot of ways, or at least letting a, a certain section of people, young children who are, you know, most of the time they're learning how to read. They're trying to find out who they are. They want to read different books, you know, and it's like stripping that right, a little, uh, stripping that right away from them, but also having a uh, adult conversation after 20 years, 30 years about, well, here's where I stand. Well, here's why I stand. And I mean, Hopefully people will watch this and not just get, uh, oh yeah, I love these books because of, you know, growing up with them, but learning more about, I would hope the oral tradition of them, what it took to write them. And then also ultimately what it took to keep them on the shelves for people to read. So, uh, you know, I think, I think you illustrated that, uh, no pun intended, of course, um, in this documentary. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Cody, thank you. Thank you. Hey, of course, dude. Um, I really appreciate you uh, coming on, doing the interview with me. Uh, if there's anything you want to plug uh, before I kind of uh, end this interview, please plug away. Tell every everybody about the documentary, where they can find it, how they can find you, uh, and everything else in between. Sure. Um, so the website is scarystoriesdoc.com. Um, you can definitely get to all social. I'm very active on social media, um, planning on kind of just – you know, to some degree, giving away all kinds of really interesting things on our YouTube channel, just to kind of like, okay, I've got tons of stuff that was great, didn't quite fit. Some of it we put in the DVD and then other things, you know, um, we'll just kind of, uh, you know, give people for free on YouTube to kind of ha have, have a nice little moment. So, um, but yes, scarystoriesdoc.com and you can get to all our social media and YouTube channel from there. Excellent. And uh, thank you once again, Cody. Really appreciate your time. Uh, this is a great interview. Just great chatting with you and, you know, getting uh, getting nostalgic together. That's always a fun time uh, with, with interviews like this. So, well, uh, thank you. I'm, yeah, of course, dude. Uh, well, I'm Matt uh, from Simplistic Reviews. Uh, you can follow us on simplisticreviews.net. That's the main website. That's the main portal for uh, everything on our social media, uh, downloading the podcast, including this one you're listening to right now, uh, and all, everything in the archive as well. So, um, hopefully next time we'll be interviewing somebody just as great as Cody here but uh, until we meet again this was a simplistic, simplistic interview and I'll be talking to you guys later